Tucked away in the lush countryside of Cheshire, England, lies Little Morton Hall, a curious and whimsical moated manor house that seems to have leapt straight out of a fairy tale. With its crooked walls and top-heavy appearance, this half-timbered treasure has captured the hearts of visitors for centuries. Hi everyone, Ken here. Today we are taking a delightful tour into England's Tudor past. Hit that subscribe button and let's explore this house. The story of Little Morton Hall begins in the early 16th century, around 1504, when William Morton, a prosperous landowner, began constructing the house. The Morton family had deep roots in the area, tracing back to the 13th century. It wasn't until the mid-14th century, however, that the family capitalized on circumstance to create a grand estate. As the Black Plague swept through Europe, the pestilence brought with it opportunity. As landowners and their kin passed away, the value of land plummeted and the Mortons purchased large tracts for next to nothing. Over the next 100 years, successive generations of the family continued to expand the house, each adding their own touch to this evolving masterpiece. At its height in the mid-16th century, the Little Morton Hall estate spanned over 1,300 acres, including a corn mill, orchards, gardens, and even an iron bloomery. However, the family's fortunes took a downturn during the English Civil War in the 17th century. As staunch royalists, the Mortons found themselves at odds with the parliamentarian neighbors. Although they eventually regained ownership after the war, the financial strain left them wanting. By the late 17th century, the Mortons no longer lived in the house, renting it out to tenant farmers. The manor's decline continued into the 19th century when it fell into disrepair. Yet despite its dilapidated state, Little Morton Hall captured the imagination of Victorian-era artists and writers, becoming a symbol of romantic decay. Amelia Edwards even used it as a setting for her 1880 novel, Lord Brackenberry. One of the most striking features of Little Morton Hall is its unique and somewhat precarious look. The building is a perfect example of traditional Tudor-era architecture, with its black-and-white timber framing and intricately patterned facades. But what makes Little Morton Hall truly special is its irregularity. The house was built in stages over more than a century, leading to a wonderfully haphazard design that includes three asymmetrical ranges surrounding a small, cobbled courtyard. The Long Gallery, a 68-foot-long room perched on the upper floor of the South Range, which we will see soon enough, is perhaps the most iconic feature of the house. Added after construction had already begun, this gallery gives the house its top-heavy appearance and has puzzled and delighted visitors for generations. The timber frame building is adorned with diagonal oak braces that create chevron and lozenge patterns, while the windows contain 30,000 leaded panes set in various geometric patterns. These features, along with the house's decorative motifs, make Little Morton Hall a true feast for the eyes. Stepping inside Little Morton Hall is like entering a labyrinth of history. The Great Hall, the heart of the house, is where the family would have gathered for meals and entertainment. Its arch-braced trusses and carved motifs, including dragons, hint at the medieval origins of the house. The hall is flanked by two impressive bay windows added in 1559, a date proudly inscribed on the windows themselves. Beyond the Great Hall, the house unfolds as a maze of rooms, each with its own character and history. The parlor, withdrawing room, and exhibition room showcase the changing taste of the Tudor and Elizabethan eras. The wooden paneling, some Georgian in origin, hides original painted panels depicting biblical scenes, a favorite theme in Protestant England. The chapel, with its Renaissance-style tempera paintings and oak screen, offers a glimpse into the religious devotion of the Morton family. The Long Gallery, located on the upper floor, is as remarkable for its crooked floors as it is for its historical significance. The gallery's walls are lined with almost continuous bands of windows flooding the space with light. It's easy to imagine the Morton family using the space for exercising games on rainy days. The upper porch room, with its fireplace depicting figures of justice and mercy, adds another layer of historical intrigue. Little Morton Hall's journey from a dilapidated manor to a national treasure is a story of dedication and care. In the early 20th century, Elizabeth Morton, the last of the Morton line, took on the task of restoring the house's chapel and stabilizing the structure of the Long Gallery. Upon her death, the house was passed to her cousin, Charles Abraham, who continued her preservation efforts. In 1938, the house was transferred to the National Trust, ensuring that this Tudor treasure would be preserved for future generations. The National Trust has carried out extensive repair and restoration work, including re-roofing, restoring elements of the hall's original appearance, and removing some painted patterning erroneously added during the earlier restoration work. 
These efforts have allowed Little Morton Hall to remain a true and well-preserved effort of Tudor architecture. What did you think about this quirky and curious manor house? Let me know down below in the comments section, and while you're there, make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an exciting episode of This House.